your full tuition if you choose. Now, I'd be delighted. We're not going to do that, but I'd be delighted to do that. And since we can't, you might see this student that won all that money back there and see if he'd help you make it happen. It's always fun to be back and to see uh, fresh faces and other faces who are a part of the chapel <laughs> service. This is a place full of memories for those of us who spent years here, and it will be for you, if the Lord leads you here, some of the best memories you'll have for the rest of your days. Uh, in every calling and in every career, there are certain, shall we say, occupational hazards. And the ministry is no exception. Uh, in, in ministry, perhaps with that in mind, we might call them uh, besetting sins. By that, I mean those areas that we're prone to fall into more easily, those temptations we tend to yield to a little more often than we even want to admit. Two come to mind, and they are perhaps the most familiar to us in the ranks of ministry. We wrestle with them, and you, as you are involved in a life of ministry, will as well. The first one is the more popular or the more commonly found of the two, and it would be hypocrisy. Hypocrisy has to do with trying to be someone we're not, leaving a, an impression that we are someone other than who we really are. It runs a close second with duplicity, appearing one thing to one person and another thing to someone else. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is clearly a lack of authenticity. Hypocrites are not authentic. That is, when we fall into hypocrisy, we are inauthentic in our lives, in our words, in our responses, our actions. People who are hypocrites busy themselves posing. Now, the second and the more subtle of the two is envy. Envy has to do with wishing we were in someone else's skin or somehow in either subtle or not so subtle ways putting other people down who are truly demonstrating strengths we may not have, wish we did, or virtues that they have cultivated better than we, and therefore we fall into the very common habit of comparing. Hypocrites pose those who fall into envy, compare. In, an, in a unique way, uh, the Lord Jesus gives a test to his most uh, strong-willed disciple. And it happens in a section of Scripture that the hurried reader would probably pass by, rushing from the resurrection on to the scene of ascension, out of John and into the book of Acts. But I'd like us to stop there by this ancient body of water that is... 13 miles long, seven and a half miles wide, and about 32 miles around, along the familiar shoreline where some of these same disciples had their beginning with Jesus. It is here in John 21 we find Jesus making his third appearance to these men whom he loves and has loved them to the end. And he's looking into the eyes of seven of the eleven faithful who have proven themselves not so faithful in the recent hours. Stop and remember. When you get to John 21, Jesus has been raised, but they have not yet caught up in their emotions. They're still confused. 
They spent three and a half years having left the nets or left their business or left the familiar world of their young adulthood and throwing themselves into this new calling. They have followed Jesus and watched him teach and watched him heal and do remarkable miracles and, in fact, be criticized and finally arrested in the garden when they all forsook him and fled and nailed to a cross and left to die. So these men come, even though they've already seen him a couple of times, they come with uh, sort of a low-grade depression, if I read the scene correctly. They're, they're disillusioned. They are unemployed. They are displaced. Their master has told him he's not only going to die, but he's going to leave them. And it is almost as if their dreams have gone up in a whoosh. And their hopes have been dashed. So not surprisingly, these seven who are named for us in, in verse 2, two are not, but the others are. There is Peter, and there is Thomas, and there is Nathaniel, and there are... James and John, and two not named, but the seven have come, and Peter says, almost with a shrug of the shoulders, I'm, I'm going fishing. We may have to fall back on what we're familiar with, and so he, he shakes the dust from the nets, and he pulls up the old boat of days past, no doubt, in his life, that familiar body of water where he made a pretty good living, and the other six say, we're going with you. So they push out to sea. It's toward evening and they fish all night. As a matter of fact, they, they not only fish all night with the casting of nets, they catch nothing. According to the end of verse 3, there's nothing to show for their effort. And the sun begins to peak over the horizon as... They sigh and exhausted, some of them have by now, no doubt, set back down and thought, hey, we can't even catch fish like we used to. Uh, I have never fished all night. I have certainly fished and caught nothing. But I have never cast nets through the night. I've only cast nets to get the bait, but I've never fished with nets. And it must be an exhausting thing. And I'll tell you this, when you catch nothing and you have fished for a long, long time, the last thing you want somebody to say is, you haven't caught anything, have you? And that's exactly what they hear from the shoreline about a hundred yards away. It's a shadowy figure. He says, hey, fellows, you haven't caught anything, have you? Their answer reveals a little impatience and maybe some impudence. No! You can just kind of hear it ringing across the water as maybe in one voice they answer back. And then this stranger says to them, cast your nets on the other side, on the right side of the boat. Surprisingly, they don't argue. They, by now, are desperate enough to try anything. And casting their nets on the other side, it is remarkable. Later in the passage, verse 11, when they've taken the time to number the fish, there's 153 of them, and they're called large fish. Let's say they were three and a half, four pounds. That's over a quarter of a ton of fish. There's a lot of fish. So many fish, they can't even draw the net into the boat. John leans over to Peter and says, Psst, it's the Lord. <laughs> I love Peter's response. He shoves both arms into his outer tunic and plunges right into the water and swims up to the shoreline. He probably is thinking we have a little unfinished business to take care of. Or maybe more likely, I would love to be near him again. Anything is better than this. Nothing is better than that. 
And so he comes to the shoreline, dripping wet. The other six, not able to pull the net into the boat, drag it along with the boat and get to the shoreline. And when they arrive, there's already a charcoal fire and fish. <laughs> Where did he get the fish? Hey, he, he made fish, so that's not a big thing. And there's bread, warm, broiled fish for breakfast, and he invites them to come and let's eat together. It's a great scene. If you like the out of doors, there are a few places better than along a lake early in the morning with a broiled meal all ready to enjoy. They sit around and casually visit with each other, maybe reminiscing, sighing, questioning, talking openly and freely. And then Jesus begins a verbal test. The first test is on hypocrisy. The second test will be about envy. Peter passes with flying colors the first test. He didn't a few hours earlier back when he said, Though all these others may fail and fall, I will be true to the end. You don't find this in Peter today. Not this morning. Not after the denials. There's no hypocrisy here. Jesus rivets his eyes on Peter and begins the dialogue. Verse 15. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Look at the question. Let your eyes study it. Don't drift. Imagine yourself in a classroom with six other students. You're sitting there having been a pretty miserable example of scholarship over the last number of days. And the teacher calls you by name, looks at you, and addresses an area of concern, and even does so comparatively more than these. There's some argument over what that refers to. I think it makes best sense to say more than these other of your contemporaries. Do you love me more than these? Peter, I'm sure by this moment, is blushing a little, but we admire him for his honesty. Yes, Lord, I love you. In the Greek text, there are two words that are used interchangeably and sometime out of a desire for difference. And here in John's Gospel, there is first the question Jesus asked, and his word is rendered by John, agapao. We get our familiar word, agape, that we toss around, love. This is a verb, and it has reference to the a divine level of love. It's a John 3.16 love. It's a love of the mind. It's a love of the will. It's a love of deep devotion without concern for the response of the other. It's a love that is focused with full attention on the good of the other. Do you love me? Love me like that more than these? Peter's answer is rendered in another term, phileo. It's a word for fondness and affection. Both mean affection, but there's a level to agapao that phileo does not reach most often. And Peter answers, I'm fond of you. Now, admittedly, they're conversing in Aramaic. We have Mel Gibson to thank for that reminder. They've been talking in Aramaic. That's the vernacular. So Aramaic would not be that specific. Perhaps the same word is used if this dialogue takes place in Aramaic. But John, who is the writer, hears the inflection in Jesus' voice and watches the body language and sees the eye contact 
And when John has a choice under the Spirit's inspiration to record the dialogue, he specifically uses the, the verb for that kind of love when Jesus asks it and this kind of love when Peter answers. I'm fond of you, Lord. Jesus very graciously, without one word of shame, with no rebuke, says to Peter, look at the response. Tend my lambs. What a great relief that must have been for a man who had failed and failed so miserably and so publicly and failed on the heels of his own proud overstatement and inflated pride of recent hours. Tend my lambs. Peter probably thinks by now the test is over. Whew. Jesus says the second time to him, do you love me? He takes away the comparative part of the question as he looks deeply into Peter's eyes and he says to him, think again. Go deeper. Is there a love for me that is at this level? Forget the others. There's no more of these in this second question. Do you love me? Peter, now blushing again, responds, uh, Less, Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. Phileo. The same interchange, same verbs rendered by John. Peter comes back with, the best I can say is, I'm fond of you. I'm drawn to you. I swam quickly toward you. We have a closeness. But if I may add this, I, I can't commit to a level that I know uh, I, I haven't reached. That's authenticity. And of all things, he asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, Are you just fond of me? He uses Peter's word, or at least John renders it that way. And somehow in the Aramaic, as they spoke it, it was clear to Peter that Jesus had lowered the level when he said, are you just fond of me? I love Peter's response. He begins with a little theology. Lord, you know all things. You are omniscient. You know me from beginning to end. You know my waking up and my lying down moments. You know when I misspeak. You know when I have failed. You know my past. You know all about the last three and a half years. How many times I spoke too quickly and acted too rashly. You know all things. Then he adds, you know that I'm fond of you. Two words for no. One is a word of academic or intellectual knowledge, that's the first one, oida. The second is gnosko, to know by experience. You know from experience, Lord, as John renders it, that that's the best I can say. And Jesus very graciously responds, tend my sheep. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that Jesus doesn't look at Peter and say, well, after all these years and all the things I've taught you, can't you at least come up to the level I'm expecting? There's none of that. We're the ones who do that. We're the ones who shame people. We're the ones who lift it, that bar just above what anybody, including ourselves, can reach. Not Jesus. He saved his face. And he gave him a 10 plus for authenticity. Good for you, Peter. A number of years ago, I was invited to speak at a, at a school in Florida. It was at that time sort of at its height in, in student body size. It had been founded by a sort of self-taught man with gifts of evangelism and uh, discipleship. And the school was just running on all cylinders. Uh, and I had the joy of going when the school was at its height, about 2,200 students, which is large for a Bible college, certainly one in that area. And uh, it was, it was uh, however, on the 
heels of a failure where the president and founder had run away with one of the students, left his marriage, left his family, and left the school to pick up the pieces. Faculty is fractured, and, and there's, a, there's a break in trust, and by now the integrity is, is on the block. Uh, I met the uh, man who was doing his best to take the former president's place, happened to be the president's son. And he met me at the airport. Never forget it, when I got off the plane, I called his name and I said, Hi, I'm Chuck. He said, Hi. Called his name. I said, How are you doing? Fantastic! I remembered reading a letter that had talked about what had happened at the school and seemed a little un unusual that he would respond. I, I still hear his voice bouncing around the echo of the, of the uh, airport there in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, amazingly, they invited me back. The next time I went back was another, uh, it was a year later. The student body was about 500, maybe 450. Way less than half the size of before. And I stepped off the plane, called his name. I remembered him. How you doing? Fantastic. We're going to turn this thing around. This is going to be great. And uh, that particular visit, I met with the faculty and by then, they were half the size, and some of them were considering leaving, and the morale was at an all-time low. I went back a third time, and the student body was not quite 200, and the school was clearly on its way down and out. And I met him at the airport, and I said, how are you doing? I'll never forget his response. He walked, he said, come here. So I walked over to him, and he wrapped his big arms around me, and he whispered, I'm growing and I'm learning, but I'm not fantastic. Uh, I could have just kissed him for saying that. I didn't, but I, I said to him, I said, good for you. Now you're talking. Ten plus for authenticity. You rarely are doing fantastic. So get rid of that word. That's a silly word. <laughs> You're often growing and learning. Practice that. Jesus, I'm growing and I'm learning, but I'm not fantastic. I'm fond of you. I think in it is I'd love to cultivate what we once had now that I've been where I've been. And I know our time is short. But I hope you read that in my answer. Jesus says, tend my lambs. So by now, Peter must be encouraged. So to cut to the chase, Jesus then looks at him and says, end of verse 19, follow me. Remember, there are two tests here. The first one, high marks, it's done very well. Now the second Follow me. One simple Greek word. Interesting, it is a second person singular present imperative. Singular meaning, I'm not saying this to the six of you, I'm saying to the seven of you, I'm saying this just to you, Peter. You, me, keep on coming after. You keep on following me, you, Peter. I take it by now that Jesus has stood up and started to walk away down that shore. And I also take it that Peter, by now, has begun to do the same. Not only Peter, but Jesus' very close disciple, John. In fact, Peter looks over his shoulder and he sees the one whom Jesus loves. And he sees him following. And so Peter... Looking around, says, Lord, what about John? I mean, you're asking me to do that. I mean, <laughs> fail the test. Jesus' response is magnificent. It's always magnificent. 
Jesus said in verse 22, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You, me, keep on following. Same verb, same word, same tense, same mode. You, singular, me, keep on following. I left out a very important part before he says that command the second time. Verse 22, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? which we would say today, paraphrased, it's none of your business. You, me, keep on following. You see what Peter did? He compared himself with another. You're asking a strong and hard and demanding thing of me. What are you asking of of her, of him, of them? You're not careful. You'll do that throughout your ministry. You're putting me through all of this. You're expecting this from me. Look at how easy he's got it. I mean, I studied just as hard in school. I worked just as hard. Sometime you'll have to admit harder than so-and-so who after graduation enters a ministry that becomes well-known and of all things Very popular across the country. And here you're slugging her away, doing your best, following him. In unguarded moments, if you are not careful, you will be submerged in envy. So I find in these uh, few verses, two or three, I think, timeless principles. And let's close with them. The first takes us back to the fishing all night and then the nets going on the other side of the boat and they're catching a huge amount because they were willing to take his orders. So let's, let me give you the first one. When the Lord offers an opportunity to change futility into f- fruitfulness, be open to change. When the Lord offers opportunity to change futility into fruitfulness, be open to change. We've got to hand it to the disciples, some of whom were experienced fishermen. When that stranger says, cast nets on the other side, they cast them on the other side. And their whole night of futility was changed to a quarter of a ton of fish. They were willing to do it. Some of you are on the edge of attending school at this place. And you're weighing all the options. Don't weigh them too long. Don't hesitate too long. Plunge right in. When you sense it's his plan, plunge in. Go after it. Like Peter plunging into the water. When he realized it was the Lord who was giving those instructions. If it's the Lord leading you to say yes, don't even think maybe. Certainly don't think no. Be open. Fruitfulness invariably accompanies the Father's will. Fruitfulness like you've never known. Second command or second principle. When his plan is to move you into a new and challenging direction, expect a period of soul searching. With Peter, it was three questions asked in front of his peers. With you, it may be long nights and some sleepless ones as you are wrestling with direction may not be as clear as the one sitting next to you. You'll go through some soul searching, just like Peter. Stay real. Think it through.
That's all part of the process. And then respond. Third, when he makes it clear that you're to follow him into a new direction, focus fully on him and no one else. Guard your heart against comparing. It'll lead you into all kinds of confusion. There are some of you here who are not just now beginning to think about coming to the school. You're here. Some of you are near your day of graduation And the Lord opens the door for you in one area, and he opens the door for another in yet another. And in years to come, you will realize that the door open for you is a door that included many tests that one of your own close classmates has never had to go through. It's none of your business. It's none of your business. Remember, it's a second person singular. He calls us one at a time, focusing on us. In ministry, there are two very real occupational hazards. In the process of your working, your growing and learning experiences of preparation, you will you will come up against them over and over. I urge you to be one of great authenticity at the same time, one who refuses to compare. It's like the old country preacher says, be who you is. If you ain't who you is, you is who you ain't. I would have never dreamed my life would have turned as it has. I live my life more surprised than anybody I've ever met. I am constantly amazed at the direction God has led me, taken me. Sitting where you're now sitting, I would have never in my wildest imaginations thought it would have included what it has. My worst days in the process occurred when I yielded to hypocrisy and envy. Don't go there. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Try us and know our thoughts. See if there be any way of pain within us and lead us in the way everlasting. We're yours, Lord, and uh, thankfully that fight is over. Now that we're with you and in you, and now that we find ourselves enveloped in your magnificent care and grace, Use this passage, use this story, use this message to clear away the fog and the trash of all the things that would interrupt clear and unmistakable leading and absolute unwavering obedience. In the name of Jesus, all of us pray. And everybody said,